and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining today on today's talk, uh, Hypomagnesemia in the Critically Ill Patient. And the title really is Magnesium in the Myocardium because so much of what we see when we have hypomagnesemia is in relationship to the cardiovascular uh, correlates. So very, really uh, profoundly important is for us to remember that hypomagnesemia is really common in critically ill patients. The reports say somewhere between 10 and 65%, but some of the most recent literature in 2023 discusses that hypomagnesemia is common in 65 or more percent of patients. So I think a lot of it depends on your venue and the context in which you operate. But I think one thing we all should be considering is that we have the possibility of having patients who are hypomagnesemic and always being concerned about that when we're evaluating patients. And in particular, when we have patients who have refractory uh, hypokalemia or present with hypocalcemia. So that really incorporates a lot of our patients. In general, we don't tend to measure magnesium as part of our initial framework and evaluation. Now, what we what, what the evidence shows is that it may or may not profoundly affect 60-day all-cause mortality, but definitely the replacement of magnesium shortens the time of mechanical ventilation and reduces length of stay. So we have to balance all of that with all-cause mortality, reminding ourselves that we may see patients because of their comorbidities, because they're on dialysis, because they have uh, chronic heart failure or chronic kidney disease, they may be patients who have much higher potential for hypomagnesemia. And a lot of current study is about how quickly magnesium is being replaced in these patients in terms of looking at whether or not that's going to affect mortality mortality. Now, I don't have that answer today, and we may not have the answer in this year, but actually that is a major uh, impetus in evaluation of patients as time goes by. Really important to remember that magnesium is a significant cofactor, that it's a major intracellular ion, second only to potassium, and that it is absolutely required for proper functioning of the AP, ATP generated sodium potassium exchange pump that maintains electric neutrality and that stimulates depolarization. And of course, ultimately after depolarization is the release of ionized calcium for contractile or vascular tone. So really, really important. Magnesium is a co-regulator of calcium. This actually regulates the mobilization of calcium into uh, the myocytes of the myocardium to maintain cardiac contractile strength and also for your vascular tone. So really important when we're thinking about the kinds of patients that we see, and we're looking at patients who have refractory hypotension, who have refractory hypokalemia, who present with hypocalcemia, and by the way, atrial fibrillation that tends to be refractory, we should always be thinking about magnesium and magnesium replacement. So I, I loved this statement. It was just a general statement that I read somewhere. It wasn't really a uh, attributed to any one person, but I love this whole perspective. And it's something that we want to carry with us that magnesium depletion has been described as the most underdiagnosed electrolyte abnormality in current medical practice. What that may mean is that when we're looking at our critically ill patients who have ventricular irritability, who have prolonged QT syndrome, who have atrial fibrillation, who have hypokalemia and or hypocalcemia, and who have failure of renal regulation, which is really important here, that we may need to supplement them pro prophylactively or preventatively with magnesium supplementation. So again, it's really important to remember that magnesium is one of the most abundant ions in the body, in the overall body, and it's involved in so many enzymatic reactions. Initially, the Early reports in like the 1980s and 1990s said two or 300, but now today we know that magnesium is responsible for such a completion of enzymatic function that without appropriate magnesium, we really lose significant enzymatic function. And most particularly, again, the sodium potassium ATPase pump.
Okay, so always remember when I talk about potassium, I talk about potassium in the cell. The potassium in the cell is the most abundant intracellular ion at around 150 milli equivalents. This is the second most abundant intracellular ion, magnesium, and the fourth most abundant ion in the total uh, in the total body. So again, that key complex, remember, is that it's a cofactor for all these different transports of ions, different transport of enzymes. It plays a, a significant role in inflammation and oxidation and anti-inflammation, antioxidation. So really important when we're looking at that overall magnesium level to just consider this property of magnesium. And what I, I think is really important is to remember, just like with potassium, that serum potassium is a reflection of cellular potassium, but cellular potassium is at 150 milli equivalents and serum is 3.5 to 5. 99% of magnesium is intracellular. So you don't see it and you don't measure it. Even when we look at uh, trying to achieve an ionized magnesium level and a total body magnesium level, we still don't actually have a guide to what the intracellular magnesium is. And there's not a co coalition or correlation factor or coefficient factor that we can evaluate to try to assume what that cellular magnesium is. So we think about these three things that actually regulate our uh, magnesium, GI absorption, uh, and renal excretion, and exchangeable bone magnesium. Now, 50 to 60% of your magnesium is actually stored and participates in exchange, exchangeable bone magnesium. Only 1% of the total magnesium is what you measure here in the extracellular or the serum space. Now that's really important, again, because what we're really concerned with is ionized magnesium. But here's the issue, of course, that occurs with all ions. Whenever serum magnesium is depleted, the cell will release magnesium into the serum to bring the serum magnesium up. So when you're drawing a serum magnesium level, this may profoundly under predict your total body hypomagnesemia. Why that's so important is to say that index of suspicion is as important, if not more important, than actually seeing a low level of magnesium on a serum draw. And that really uh, brings it home to us. I know that sometimes people have a question about why physicians or providers are ordering magnesium when the magnesium level looks normal. But if you have a clinical presentation that is possibly in coexistence with hypomagnesemia, it may be very beneficial to actually administer magnesium to our patients. So we just take a quick look at magnesium measures and, and how they're maintained. Of course, the lowest level is the ionized magnesium. Then the total serum magnesium, depending on what you measure, are using SI units, traditional units in uh, mix per deciliter or milli equivalents per liter, just depending on your lab and where you are, where you are, what country you're in, and how you're evaluating this. But it gives us all of those potentials. And then, of course, the potentials in milli equivalents or in millimoles per liter of ionized. And then we look at our urine magnesium and urine magnesium has such a wide range. Serum magnesium is a tight range. Cellular magnesium is even tighter range. So your homeostasis keeps magnesium under a tight range and it's going to reflect that by urine reabsorption or urine excretion. And the kidney is the primarily responsible organ for the regulation of magnesium. So that's really important when we're considering that, that what we look at is that urine magnesium that should always be reflective of maintaining that constant homeostatic state in the serum and the serum to the cell. 
Now that's that's quite important. I'm not gonna talk very much about it, but one of the things that we can do when we're trying to evaluate patients is we can test the kidney by administering magnesium and seeing are they, are they able to waste magnesium. Uh, that helps us to rule out if this is a renal problem when we have patients who are not, uh, not able actually to reabsorb or waste magnesium because that's the kidney's role. In the tubules of the kidney, most particularly the distal tubule of the kidney, is where primary reabsorption of magnesium occurs. So a lot of magnesium passes through the kidney, but we reabsorb the majority of it. And so when we're testing the kidney, we give a magnesium load and we look at whether the kidney reabsorbs or wastes that magnesium. And that helps us to determine if this is actually a kidney issue. And most commonly, it will be a kidney issue. Now, again, I want to remind you that the majority of your magnesium is intracellular and the intracellular magnesium will uh, actually alter in order to maintain the um, extracellular magnesium. So only 0.5% of your total magnesium is actually uh, free and not bound to ATP. As it's bound to ATP, it's not necessarily usable or mobile back and forth across the cellular membrane. And then we just take a quick look at this relationship, which I think is just so profoundly interesting, is your daily net uptake of magnesium. And that would be your oral uptake, or in the ICU, we're talking about administering magnesium, about 100 milligrams. And that goes into the blood compartment, then is perfused through the kidney. The kidney fil filters 2,400 milligrams of magnesium a day, and it reabsorbs, it reabsorbs 2,300. So guess what? Uptake is 100 output is 100, but you've got to have a normal functional kidney, and in particular, the distal convoluted tube. So one of the things to remember, understanding that the kidney is so incredibly responsible for the regulation of magnesium, is that when we promote uh, water and ion wasting, like with loop diuretics, particularly Lasix, uh, also with chlorothiocytes, what we're going to see is some loss of magnesium. And we need to be really aware of that because hypomagnesemia in a heart failure patient who you might be diuresing because they have heart failure or they have a volume overload, hypomagnesemia actually puts the myocardium more at risk. So we're going to be really aware of that when we're looking at the primary role of the kidney, which is to filter at the glomerulus and reabsorb at the distal convoluted tubule to reabsorb that magnesium. Now you got to have blood flow to filter and you have oxygen, you have to have oxygen delivery to the tubules for the tubules to reabsorb and to maintain that barrier and the capability to reabsorb the magnesium. So typically you're going to lose about hundred a day if you're getting hundred a day in, and if you have appropriate filtration and reabsorption of the kidney. Now, most of our magnesium actually is going to be processed in the intestine. Okay. So that'll be about 360 milligrams. The intestine absorbs 120 and it secretes 20. And so the daily fecal output is around 260. So totally you have a hundred that has actually entered into your system. And when you have diarrhea, that's going to alter your ability to maintain uh, magnesium, particularly if it's secretory diarrhea. Okay, so those are the really important ones. This is where magnesium resides in your muscles and in your bones and in other tissues around totally about 4,900 milligrams of magnesium resides. Okay, so where is it? Okay, well, in hospital, we're doing a serum magnesium assay, but a serum magnesium assay doesn't really tell us about an ionized magnesium. We have to do a spectrophot photometry to actually look at all three fractions, the ionized, the bound, and the chelated. Now we take a look at this and you can see here's where all your magnesium content is. Some folks actually like to look at red blood cells. You have to have particular equipment, a particular order. You can look at red blood cell uptake of magnesium. That can be also very helpful. That'll give you a good information about your total body magnesium content. Okay. What causes it? Most of the time you're gonna determine a cause or a suspicion 
for hypomagnesemia from the history and the physical examination. And most particularly, it'll be related to understanding medications that the patient is on. There's a very nice list of particular medications that promote hypomagnesemia. And in particular, those most commonly, we're gonna look at that list, most commonly are gonna be diuretics, some antibiotics, and PPIs, so omeprazole. These are all gonna be, uh, villains in the management of magnesium. So a lot of times you're going to suspect it knowing what the patient's history is, what medications they've been taking. It is also really important to remember that the primary regulator, that wide range of magnesium excretion is the kidney. So again, based on what we know about the patient, based on what we know about the kidney, based on knowing whether the patient's been on CRT or they're on dialysis or, or they have chronic kidney disease and chronic heart failure, all of these are gonna guide us to having an index of suspicion about hypomagnesemia. Now I'm not really talking here about hypermagnesemia. I'm only really talking about hypomagnesemia. Hypermagnesemia is pretty rare. It's really uncommon. But hypomagnesemia, I think we're seeing, I think we're seeing it every day in our critical patients. Okay, so one of the ways you look at this is, of course, by looking at kidney excretion or reabsorption of magnesium. So uh, for anybody who's a provider, I think we have at least one provider on the call. Uh, we can look at what's known as fractional excretion of magnesium, and that's urine mag times plasma creatinine. Uh, and then plasma mag times urine creatinine and that plasma mag times the standard factor is 0 0.7. That doesn't change. That kind of estimates the amount of magnesium out of the total that is free or not ionized and you multiply that times 100. So it's very similar to the FENA, uh, fractional excretion of sodium, which we use to diagnose renal dysfunction and to look at where renal dysfunction is. This is another way that we can look at um, whether or not you are inappropriately wasting magnesium. So remember, inappropriate wasting of magnesium, you're gonna be making urine. Typically, you're gonna have a normal GFR and you might be getting, in particular, you're getting uh, diuretics, you might be getting amphotericin B, you might be on chemotherapy. Uh, and again, PPIs, oh my gosh, who knew that it was such a profound issue related to the administration of PPIs. And, and we're using lots of PPIs when we have patients, critical patients and acute patients. But if what you see is that the um, fractional excretion magnesium is less than 1.5, two is the border, but 1.5 or one, your fractional excretion magnesium is low. This is not an extra, uh, this is not an intrarenal wasting. It's an extra renal loss. And so again, we're gonna go back and look at other medications that might interfere with magnesium uptake. Um, and we're gonna revisit the patient and talk about diarrhea, talk about other kinds of concerns. And if we're in the ICU and we're not really talking to the patient because he's intubated on a ventilator, we're gonna correlate that back to whether or not the patient's had diarrhea or, or other, um, other reasons to be wasting his magnesium. Okay, so let's think about something else, other reasons. Number one, hypercalcemia. Whenever patients are hypercalcemic, unless it's related to hyperparathyroidism, which causes hypercalcemia, but anytime your patient has hypercalcemia, that's actually going to inhibit the reabsorption of magnesium, okay? So when you're hypercalcemic, you're gonna waste more magnesium. The only time that doesn't occur is when you have hyperparathyroidism because that hyperparathyroid hormone actually stimulates magnesium resorption. So really, really important. We're kind of, when we have high calcium, we're gonna waste more magnesium. Severe phosphate depletion. I don't think we're very good at looking at phosphorus in our patients. Uh, uh, and, and that's something to always be considering and thinking about that phosphorus and phosphate gives the uh, actual building blocks to our energy molecule, ATP. Those are three phosphates on that uh, adenosine. There's three phosphate binders. And phosphate is a really important uh, enzyme or ion. Um, I want to really focus this on patients who are on dialysis and CRRT. So one thing that's really important is we have to appreciate what our, our 
therapy solution contains. Now, for those of you who work at Grady, in our CRRT, we only use two different solutions. We use a 2K solution. That 2K solution does not have phosphorus. So by 24 hours, you are typically, typically going to see that you have a patient who is hypophosphatemic and hypomagnesemic. So if you're using 2K, you should expect to see hypophosphatemia and hypo, uh, hypomagnesium at around 24, maybe 48 hours. You need to be really aware of that. Now, we don't typically run patients on 2K solution for very long because we usually use that in the beginning when a patient's potassium level is quite high, above 6 or 6.5, in order to bring the potassium levels down. And then we transition over to the 4K bath. Our 4K bath has one gram of phosphorus. It has magnesium as well. It's a very small amount of magnesium. And you will still occasionally, probably frequently, see hypophosphatemia in a patient who's on a 4K bath. For all of us on this call, no matter where it is that you work, if you're doing dialysis, if you're doing CRT, if you're doing PD, you need to actually know what's in your therapy solution because that instrumentation typically is going to promote magnesium loss. Now, if my patient's lost phosphorus and he's lost magnesium through his CRT or his dialysis, that is going to profoundly affect their ability to actually recover, to have diaphragmatic strength, to get off the ventilator, to have muscle tone, to have vascular tone. And it's really important for us to be considering in those patients. We also know that uh, patients who are who uh, come to us and are being withdrawn from alcohol, patients with ethanol, all of that impairs tubular magnesium reabsorption, reabsorption. So bringing back into the blood that which we need. And so we're gonna be wasting magnesium through, uh, through our urine and also uh, in intragastric. So really important for us to consider that when we put patients on protocols for alcohol withdrawal, when we're looking at patients maybe who come into the ECC, who are in acute withdrawal, we always need to consider uh, the role of magnesium in those patients. And of course, my favorite, which is my favorite thing to talk about, not my favorite thing to see, my favorite thing to talk about, which is metabolic acidosis. And to remember that in metabolic acidosis, we have a shifting of intra-ions into the serum. Now we have ionic depletion. And the most primary one that's affected by metabolic acidosis is potassium. Remember the cell takes up hydrogen and releases potassium into the serum. The serum potassium goes up or looks normal and the cellular potassium is low. Your cellular magnesium will also be low in metabolic acidosis. This is an intracellular loss. And you, if you're making urine, you will also then have magnesium loss in the uh, renal wasting. Okay. Is it something else? So what, what you're looking at here are the primary drugs that are associated with hypomagnesemia. And you can see here that when you administer furosemide, 50% of patients who've received furosemide will have hypomagnesemia, okay? That's really significant. Um, and aminoglycosides, much lower, amphotericin, digitalis, pentamidine, a little bit lower, cisplatin and cyclosporin, not quite as common, but you will see it. Secretory diarrhea, alcohol abuse, also in patients with diabetes mellitus. Um, and, and you also have a, a correlation of insulin resistance associated with this hypomagnesemia and also an acute myocardial infarction. So really important for us to say, when I have patients with these predisposing conditions and I have some suspicion about hypomagnesemia, I maybe I, I measured a serum magnesium level. It looks okay, but I have a suspicion because I'm having trouble with their potassium resuscitation or having trouble maintaining a normal calcium level. I'm going to go ahead and replace magnesium, even if the magnesium level looks normal in the serum. I'm going to go ahead and replace their magnesium. Now, I want to make sure that we appreciate it. When you look at this, this is such an interesting correlate. In hypokalemia, 40% of the time you'll have hypomagnesemia. Hypophosphatemia, 30% of the time you'll have hypomagnesemia. Hyponatremia, 27% of the time. And hypocalcemia, 22% of the time. The most common things that we see in patients are really related to electrical depolarization and mechanical response. So when we talk about the myocardium, we're going to talk about dysrhythmia. 
and we're going to talk about contractile dysfunction. And when we talk about the nervous system, typically what we're going to see first is going to be hyperreactive uh, central nervous system syndrome. That means a lot of jerking whenever there's a loud noise or a touch or anything that disturbs kind of the uh, the process, loud noise, touching, shouting, yelling, wake up, open your eyes, jerk, jerk, jerk. This is called hyperreactive CNS syndrome. And it's actually quite common when we see patients with hypomagnesemia. We can see a lot of other things associated with it that really are more correlated to like hypocalcemia, like Chabaz tax or Trousseau's. Remember the your hand flapping or your cheek twitching upon particular types of stimulation. Um, but when we're looking directly at hypomagnesemia, we really talk about dysrhythmia. And of course, the most common dysrhythmia will be torsa du point. Now, the other dysrhythmia that you can see is unexplained or un, uh, unresponsive atrial fibrillation. So right now, uh, I know I've got some at least one person here from the CVICU. So I'm just going to mention there's a patient in bed 10 who came into the hospital, who had a very high potassium, has chronic renal disease. She has new onset atrial fibrillation. She has a lot of fasciculation movements whenever you make any noise in her room. And I would tell you, I would definitely investigate whether or not she has hypomagnesemia. She has many other problems as well. And that's bed 10. So those of you who are from CVSU, when you get there tonight or tomorrow, take a look at her. Okay. Diuretics, leading cause of magnesium deficiency. So I want to make sure you appreciate it's most commonly the loop diuretic. So that would be like uh, etocrine and, and furosemide. Uh, the potassium sparing diuretics like spirolactone, aldactone, those are not really quite uh, quite associated in general You because you preserve potassium, you also preserve magnesium. In general, you're not going to see hypomagnesemia with those patients, but the most common cause. So that means it's always that you're having an index of suspicion. Patients who are making a lot of urine, patients in DKA, patients in diabetes insipidus, patients who are receiving diuretics, patients who are in rhabdomyolysis, patients who are making a lot of urine are probably wasting a lot of magnesium. So we're always going to be concerned most of the time, we're pretty happy when somebody's making urine, as long as it's good urine. This is not good urine. This is going to be urine that is rich in magnesium and will be depleting our stores of magnesium. As the serum magnesium goes down, the cellular magnesium is released. So the cell will become hypomagnesemic, but you might not ever know it unless you are suspecting it because you're looking at a relatively normal serum mag in a patient who actually has criteria for significant and profound intracellular hypomagnesemia. Okay, so again, furosemide is very common. In older patients, thiazide diuretics, which are commonly used in elderly patients, can also cause some magnesium depletion. Okay, antibiotic therapy. So again, pretty particular to aminoglycosides, to amphotericin B, and to pentamidine. And they actually block the reabsorption. Aminoglycosides in particular are highly linked to that, blocking the reabsorption in the ascending loop of Henle that kind of goes into the distal tubule. And 30% of patients who are receiving aminoglycoside therapy actually have hypomagnesemia. So I know that uh, some, some discussion actually arose about magnesium replacement. Why is the physician ordering or the provider ordering magnesium replacement on this patient who has a normal serum MAC level, but it might be because that patient's receiving aminoglycosides or they're receiving amphotericin B. Okay. The other thing that's really important is prolonged use of PPI. And that not, not if you take it for a day or two and then you don't take it again for a couple of weeks, but if you're taking it consistently for at least two weeks up to uh, or past 13 years. So, I mean, if you're taking it for 14 years, it doesn't automatically go away that you're not going to have severe hypomagnesemia and that's going to be quite important. We also see that we can uh, see an evolution of hypomagnesemia with patients who are receiving digitalis. In general, that's not a common agent for us anymore. We have we have other agents that work well on uh, atrial dysrhythmias that don't have some of the secondary effects of digitalis. You might still see patients be admitted to you who are on digitalis therapy because dig is still the only pure oral inotrope, 
um, that we can use outside of the hospital in general. So you may see older patients who come to you with digitalis on board or the possibility of digitoxicity, but that's not that common. What we do see very commonly though, is of course the utilization of epinephrine. So again, thinking about epinephrine and how epinephrine promotes insulin resistance, it also promotes ketosis, the cells up, uptake, uh, the metabolic acid and in exchange release potassium and magnesium. So potassium and magnesium in the serum may be normal, but in the cell, it may be low. And uh, most of us that are on this call, because mostly we're working with critical patients, we have very few patients that we're actually going to be administering cisplatin, cyclosporin, or other uh, anti-neoplasm agents, but those also have been linked with hypomagnesemia. Alcohol admission, and I've mentioned this already, 85% of patients who are admitted with delirium tremens actually have hypomagnesemia. That's part and parcel to their delirium tremens. That actually uh, proliferates and precipitates their, um, their muscle movement and their fasciculations. 30% of hospital admissions for alcohol abuse in a very large study, about 60,000 patients, 30% of those patients actually had hypomagnesemia. Now, really important to remember, you never give magnesium replacement to a patient who's in alcohol withdrawal or delirium tremens without giving thiamine first. You need to give thiamine first. That's actually going to stabilize the uptake of the magnesium. And it actually creates a transformation of the thiamine that actually is going to support the reabsorption of that magnesium. So always give thiamine first, uh, or at least at the same time, not later, not as a second thought. You have to give that immediately when you're doing uh, magnesium repletion. And in general, with patients who are in withdrawal, you're going to give magnesium regardless of what the serum mag level says. And then just to remind yourself, secretory diarrhea, that's lower GI tract diarrhea, the secretions from the lower tract are what are rich in magnesium, the higher level in the GI tract is not actually going to secrete nearly as much magnesium. I think it's very important to remember about diabetes mellitus, okay? And same thing that we talk about here that we talk about every time we talk about diabetes. So when we talk about diabetes and a patient who's in a diabetic crisis, first of all, if you have uh, hyperglycemia and you have any functional kidney process, you're going to have polyuria because the kidney is going to waste the glucose, the glucose pulls the water, and along with that glucose will go the accompanying ions. So those patients frequently will be hypokalemic. They won't look hypokalemic to you, but they will be hypokalemic. They will be hypomagnesemic. They will be hypophosphatemic. Why don't they look like that to you? Because the cells are releasing the magnesium and potassium. So from cell to serum to urine, when you look at the serum, you don't actually see that the patient is hypokalemic or hypomagnesemic. But if they are polyuric, you should always suspect that's true. If they are polyuric plus acidotic, you should really suspect that's true. And then what happens is that because individuals are looking at somebody in DKA, remember who has metabolic acidosis and polyuria, in the beginning, if they measured serum of magnesium, they say, oh, most of these patients are not hypomagnesemic, but at around 12 hours later, once the patients receive some insulin, once the patients receive some volume, once ketosis has been decreased and the gap step starts to narrow, what you see is transition of potassium and magnesium back into the cell. And now it becomes apparent in the serum that the patient is hypokalemic and hypomagnesemic. Before they were normal to high, and as soon as you treat them, they drop. Now we know, anybody who's listened to anything I've ever said, I always talk about the American College of Clinical uh, Endocrinologists recommendation. Uh, and I would say that recommendation is going to hold true to magnesium as well. They talk about if your potassium is six or above, give insulin and volume and follow with a second level of potassium and then do potassium repletion. If your potassium is five to six, give potassium at the same time that you give insulin and fluid. 
If your potassium is less than four, do not give insulin until you've given potassium because those patients will transition rapidly from serum hyperkalemia. Remember serum hyperkalemia and cellular hypokalemia. And once you reduce the acidosis, the serum potassium will move into the cell. The cell's potassium level will come up, but now you don't have a reservoir of potassium. It's going to be the same thing with magnesium. So I think when you're looking at repletion of potassium in a diabetic ketoacidotic patient, you should also be repleting magnesium, whether the level says so or not, because the same exact process is going to occur. In a recent study published in, uh, actually in 2023, uh, in the uh, American Heart Journal, the, actually not the Heart Journal, the American College of Cardiology, Cardiology Journal, uh, is that hypomagnesium is reported in up to 80% of patients with acute myocardial infarction. Now, whether that's from chelation or, uh, or a binding chelation because of myocardial ischemia and necrotic tissue. It's unclear. There's not an absolute clarity about why hypomagnesemia occurs in acute myocardial infarction, but this is something that we should always be considering when we have a fresh STEMI, we have a patient who comes back to us from the cath lab. And of course, it is very common in patients post-cardiac surgery if they've been on bypass. So really, really important. Other things can cause this. I, I just gave you a basic little list here. Uh, these may or may not be agents that you're using. But again, it's really important to remember if we're giving agents that can induce some uh, failure of the tubules, that's called a, a nephrotoxic acute tubule necrosis, Anything that could be renal poisoning can actually cause hypomagnesemia because it interrupts that reabsorption excretion process. So really, really important for us to consider. Okay. And again, I think I already talked about these drugs. Really important. All right. So again, we go back to these clinical conditions, the clinical findings and predisposing. And we're going to say, this is a lot of our patients, alcohol abuse, Diabetes, diabetics in crisis, either they can be in I, uh, uh, HSS or they can be in DKA, they can be acute MI, they can be receiving Lasix and therapy for congestive failure. These are all going to be patients who can, of course, present with hypomagnesemia. And again, whether we see it or not, they can present with hypomagnesemia. And again, that serum magnesium level is going to fool us so significantly. So how am I going to see it? Okay, well, lots of signs and symptoms, right? The ones we're going to think about the most, because we're talking about ICU patients, it's going to be cardiovascular and neuromuscular system, central nervous system. And always to remember that when you see hypokalemia, you should always assume hypomagnesemia. When you see hypocalcemia, you should always assume hypomagnesemia. Most of the time, we're not really looking at magnesium levels. We're always looking at potassium levels. And generally, we're looking at calcium levels. It comes back to us on our basic chem profile. But we need to make sure that we're associating that with magnesium. And similar to um, albumin and calcium relationships, you have some albumin and magnesium relationship as well. So always be aware of that in case you have hypoalbuminemia along with hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, that part of that part and parcel is related to that low albumin. All right, so how am I going to see it? Well, unfortunately, there's nothing specific, and that's really a problem. It's often very convoluted because hypomagnesemia is generally seen with depletion of potassium and or phosphorus and or calcium. So lots of signs and symptoms that we see are related to low calcium or low potassium or low phosphorus right? That's really, really important to us. But I want to make sure that we understand. There are two things that I want to always encourage you. When you're giving potassium and your patient's potassium is not repleting, it's not predictably increasing after the administration of potassium, there are two things I want you to consider. The first one is I want you to consider the patient's um, homeostatic pH. So it's really important. So you're going to look at their bicarb, their total serum CO2. You don't even have to do a blood gas. Just look at the total serum CO2 or bicarb on your chemistry panel. If bicarb or total serum CO2, same thing, is elevated, that means that the patient has alkalosis. And if they have alkalosis, you cannot resuscitate potassium. Why is that? Because the cell is going to take up potassium 
and release the metabolic acid hydrogen to try to neutralize the pH. So first and foremost, when you are struggling to replace potassium, immediately look at the state of the pH. Don't have to have a blood gas, just look at the bicarb or total serum CO2. If your patient is alkalotic, you will not be able to resuscitate their potassium or their magnesium. And every bit of potassium and magnesium that you give the patient will move those into the cell, but you've got to actually fix their alkalosis first. So you could give 240 milli equivalents of potassium. You could give 16 grams of magnesium, but in an alkalotic environment, you won't be able to resuscitate the cell uh, or to resuscitate the serum because all of that will go into the cell. And now the cell will be hyperkalemic and hypermagnesemic. That's really important. First thing you look at is the state of the pH. Look at the total serum CO2 of the bicarb on your chemistry profile. The second thing that you're going to look at, my friends, is if I have given you 20, 40, 60 of potassium, from my point of view, I wouldn't have given you that without magnesium to begin with. But I want you to appreciate if you're resuscitating potassium and the patient is not responsive, you need to step back and say, do they need magnesium? And they need to have magnesium correction before you can correct the potassium. So think about, I know that everybody on this call has had a patient where they've given 20, 40, 60, 80, 120, 240 of potassium over a two-day period or a three-day period of time, and that potassium hasn't moved at all from 2.8, 2.93, 3.1. Hasn't moved. Well, if, if all things are normal, when you give that potassium, you should be able to replace the potassium. But when the cell is taking up potassium and releasing metabolic acid to try to bring the environment back to normal, or if you have hypomagnesemia, and those two are actually oftentimes coexisting, you're not going to be able to resuscitate their potassium until you replete their magnesium and restore their pH. So you got to, you got to waste some of that bicarb and you may actually even need to consider administration of some type of acid. You could do it even with sodium chloride, just by giving them some hyperchloremia, making them a bit more acidotic. Okay, how will I see it? I'm gonna suspect it whenever I see hypocalcemia, okay? Really, really important uh, to suspect hypomagnesemia when I see hypocalcemia. And very important to remember, again, I cannot correct your calcium if I haven't repleted your magnesium. So again, I'm treating you for hypocalcemia. I'm generally doing that pretty urgently. You've got MTP, you've got decreased cardiac index. I'm giving you some calcium. I'm giving you calcium because of potassium, uh, because uh, of hyperkalemia. I'm giving you calcium to try, try to work as a cofactor to stabilize the cellular membrane. I'm giving you insulin to move the potassium into the cell. But now all of a sudden I discover that I can't replete your calcium, right? Well, then I need to give you magnesium. Same thing with uh, a little bit different though with hypophosphatemia. Hypophosphatemia causes magnesium depletion. And that's because when you have hypophosphatemia, you're going to enhance the excretion of magnesium in exchange for the reabsorption of phosphorus and that kidney response that occurs. So when your serum phosphate levels are low, as long as you have a functional kidney, you will excrete more magnesium in order to reabsorb or resorb more phosphorus. So remember, ions are always working in exchange, and the most particular ones that work in exchange are going to be phosphorus and magnesium, hydrogen and magnesium and potassium, and calcium and magnesium. Okay, so how will I see it? Magnesium depletion causes a rapid depolarization of cardiac cells. So we see tachyarrhythmias. We see atrial tachyarrhythmia, that's atrial fibra, atrial flutter. We're going to see ventricular tachyarrhythmia. You might be lucky. You might have gotten some free forewarning with multiple PVCs, or you might just see that the patient goes straight 
into torsad du point. Now, magnesium also promotes a normal QT. So when I'm hypomagnesemic, I'm going to have a prolonged QT that causes a long QT syndrome. Remember, as that T wave occurs later and later, the possibility of firing an impulse on the T wave occurs. And of course, that's what causes torsades. The most important dysrhythmia associated with magnesium depletion is torsad du point. But uh, I would tell you that I really wasn't thinking, and, uh, and I've studied magnesium a lot, I wasn't really thinking about the increased incidence of atrial fibrillation, but of course it's all tachyarrhythmia. So I've got profound atrial irregularity in atrial tachycardia in atrial fibrillation. So again, when we're using amiodarone, we're trying to treat our AFib, right? I'm not talking about amiodarone for torsad. As you know, amiodarone is not the primary recommended agent for torsad, magnesium is. But I've got, I've got a patient on amiodarone. I gave them a bolus. I put them on a drip. I titrated the drip up. Patient still has AFib. Need to be thinking about, is this a possibility? Is it possible that the patient has hypomagnesemia? Okay, so if we just take a quick look at some of the EKG changes, this is like moderate to severe magnesium deficiency. So you can see here that your patient has a prolonged uh, with QRS. And when they get really severe, uh, you don't see it that well here, but the PR prolongs, the QT gets wider, the QRS is wide. And with severe magnesium depletion, typically the T wave becomes uh, flat. It may actually even invert. But with kind of a moderate severe magnesium deficiency, you may see a peak T wave, okay? And then you look at all these other abnormalities down here, hyper and hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia. And remember that frequently you're gonna see those together, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. Those are really common to see in partnership. And it makes it really hard to say what actually is the primary electrical deficit. So now let's take a quick look at one of our patients. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. Uh, one of our patients, 60-year-old man presented at the ED with palpitations, altered mental state due to VTAC. Uh, ongoing VTAC and his medical history includes that he has pneumo, uh, pneumococcus, he has non-tuberculosis, mycobacterium complex, MAC. He has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart failure, rheumatoid arthritis. He's always in a pro-inflammatory state. No history of cardiovascular disease, syncope or sudden cardiac death. Afebrile, normal pulse. Uh, normally he has a normal pulse, but right now he has a pulse rate of 180. He's hypotensive. He's satting pretty well on six liters of nasal cannula. He has a respiratory rate of 25 and no peripheral edema. When we listen to him, he has bilateral crackles and we hear a very irregular rhythm without murmurs. And then we see this, okay? So everybody on this call recognizes that this is torsad du point, okay? And uh, he gets here, he gets defibrillated. Here, he gets defibrillated, but he's also received magnesium, okay? And magnesium is what you need to do. Now, lots of times people want to give patients like this amiodarone. Amiodarone is going to make this worse, right? We're going to, I mean, we might end up having to give amiodarone, but our first drug of choice will be magnesium. And typically you're going to give between two and four grams of magnesium. A lot of that depends on your protocol, depends on your pharmacist, depends on how up to date your physician is. Two grams to four grams, both are going to be okay. It doesn't, it, you know, no one's going to break the bank over whether it's two grams or four grams. But right now, I think most of us are leaning towards a higher dose of magnesium sulfate, four grams. Okay, so after he received his magnesium, after defibrillation, this is his EKG. Okay, so he's got some inverted T waves. He has a partial uh, half of his left bundle is blocked. That's the left anterior hemi block. And he has a prolonged QTC at uh, 571. Okay. So this wasn't our patient. This is a patient from a case study. Uh, and during hospitalization, he continuously gets infusions of calcium and magnesium sulfate, but he also continues to have a magnesium deficiency. They've act they actually see it in the serum and he has a prolonged QT syndrome. Okay, and what I want you to look at on this patient, which is what I think is so remarkable, is you're seeing the patient here at one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on days, okay? 
so on days. And here are his magnesium levels. So you can see over his 13 or so days in the hospital, every red arrow is showing you that he's getting magnesium. He's getting magnesium supplementation. First, he gets it IV and then he gets it orally. Okay. And what you also see in relationship to this is when his magnesium levels are low, his QT corrected is very, is very high. It's much higher. And it comes down and then it goes back up and it comes down, it goes back up, it comes down, it goes back up. Okay. And that's really, really important. So what you're seeing here is he's getting magnesium supplementation. And this is really, really profoundly important is that magnesium supplementation, we give the patient a bolus of magnesium, it doesn't last very long. And we have to consider what are we going to do to try to stabilize our patient's magnesium level. And in this case, this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. He's hyperinflamed. He's consuming his magnesium through his hyperinflammation. He also has a vitamin. Uh, he has a vitamin D uh, deficit. So right here, where he gets this green arrow, he gets magnesium plus vitamin D, and then he's getting repleted orally with magnesium and vitamin D over time. And look what happens to his QTC. It really does actually stabilize at a relatively normal level right around, right around three, okay? Uh, right around, yeah, four, 4.5, sorry, milliseconds per hundred. So right around 450. And remember for men, uh, 470 um, milliseconds is what we're gonna consider. So way early on here, you can see how high his QT was, was all the way up to like almost close to six, really put him at risk. That was when, of course, we saw the torsad to point. And this is him as he goes over time. So again, want to remind you, if you are lucky enough to see that your patient has a low serum mag, which you may not see, it's always a predictor for cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. Hypomagnesemia is always associated with cardiac instability in terms of repolarization and can contribute to sudden cardiac death and heart failure. Okay, the neurologic findings, as I mentioned before, is like altered mentation, generalized seizures, fasciculations, hyperreflexia, and these are all pretty, pretty rare uh, and don't really have much diagnostic value. But just remember, if you're making noise, you touch the patient, anything like that can stimulate this reactive CNS uh, response, and that's frequently seen with magnesium deficiency. If we look at electrolyte hemostasis, we just want to remember that uh, hypomagnesemia can promote hypokalemia, can inhibit the mobilization of potassium. And of course, that issue of hypokalemia is increased secretion in the distal nephron and the distal tubule. Along with that secretion of potassium is the secretion of magnesium. And then just to remember, about 20% of our patients will also have hypocalcemia. Now, there's some other things that are important. One of them is your patient will become more and more and more insulin resistant with hypomagnesemia. Now, that's really important. That means Quite honestly, if you're on insulin for diabetes, you should probably be taking a magnesium supplementation. Magnesium deficiency is also associated with photophobia, which is something you might uncover in the ICU patient, may also precipitate, proliferate migraine headaches. And of course, we all know that hypomagnesemia can promote uh, smooth muscle spasm in the pulmonary bronchioles and promote asthma, quite common. But I like this. I think this is such a wonderful visual. So what you're looking at here is your patient's magnesium level in millimoles. And so this is your normal, this is your standard level of magnesium. This is your ionized magnesium. And if we look up here, we look up here, we see that that's the lowest risk of mortality, all cause mortality. So in patients who've got cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, AFib, heart failure, et cetera, all cause mortality, relatively low here. As you become more and more hypocalcemic, look at how much that rises. Mortality is really, really significant with hypomagnesemia. Now you have a mortality increase with hypermagnesemia, but not nearly the increase that you see with hypomagnesemia. And again, 
right? These are nonspecific signs and symptoms. We might not see that your serum magnesium is low. However, we should always be suspe suspecting it. Again, in patients that are receiving diuretic therapy, in particular, again, loop diuretics, in patients who have congestive heart failure, in patients who have chronic kidney disease, in patients who have diabetes mellitus, in patients who've had any period of polyuria, we should always be suspecting hypomagnesemia and looking at that increase in mortality with the decrease in magnesium that's associated is a really clear and present danger for critical patients. So replace it, replace it. Now here you look at it, oral replacement. Uh, oral replacement is actually more constant and better to sustain over time. In the ICU, of course, we're gonna, you've got a critical magnesium deficit. We're gonna give it to you intravenously, but magnesium supplementation actually actually helps to reduce the proliferation of heart failure, reduces those dysrhythmias. And remember, AFib is one of the big ones. Of course, we talk about VT, we talk about torsade de point, but also it's a really very important component in reducing acute myocardial infarction, ventricular arrhythmia. So just PVCs, supplementation with magnesium, actually improves Insulin responsiveness reduces that insulin resistance. So that's very helpful, very helpful in obesity as well from an insulin resistance perspective. And magnesium actually promotes vasodilation and some relaxation of your smooth muscles. So it's been highly linked to reduction in stroke. Okay, so let's do just really quickly magnesium replacement. Okay. So there's lots of different protocols. In fact, I was looking at protocols when I realized I was late for the call, right? So for mild asymptomatic hypomagnesemia, patient may not have any apparent signs and symptoms, but the serum mag is one to 1 1.4 milliequivalents per liter. We're going to assume that their deficit is really much more significant than it looks because about 50% of whatever magnesium I'm gonna give that patient is gonna be lost in the urine. So we're gonna always assume that the deficit of the patient's magnesium, we're gonna actually multiply the replacement times two. So they're gonna get one milliequivalent per kilogram for the first 24 hours and 0 0.5 milliequivalents per kilogram daily for the next three to five days. So this is not one and done. We're going to have to stabilize the magnesium, stabilize the cardiac cell by repleting magnesium over time. And remember, when we looked at that visual, when we gave magnesium, you would bolus the magnesium level would go up and then it would come right back down, go up and then it would come right back down. And from all of this, we've learned that you need to be repleting magnesium over time. So that's really important. Okay. Two caps here, R and E, replace with moderate hypomagnesemia. Usually those patients may have some simple symptoms, right? We're gonna, we're gonna look at them. If we have a serum magnesium deficit at less than one milliequivalent per liter on their lab, or a serum magnesium level that is associated with hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, or, and or hypophosphatemia, we're going to give six grams of max sulfate. And we're going to, we're going to actually dilute that. We have to dilute it because it's a really a strong concentration, but we're going to dilute it in isotonic saline. We're not going to give it with lactated ringers because calcium will bind up the magnesium. There's calcium in lactated ringers, there's calcium in plasmolite. So you're always going to give mag in normal saline. Okay, you're going to follow that with five grams of mag sulfate in 250 to 500 of isotonic saline over the next six hours. So in nine hours, your patient's going to have received 11 grams of magnesium sulfate. And then you're going to continue with five milligrams every 12 hours by continuous infusion. So divide it into your hourly rate for the next five days. Now, just in 2023 at the Society of Critical Care Medicine, published in the Critical Care Medicine Journal and presented at the Society of Critical Care Medicine meeting, was the idea of using fixed magnesium doses, not weight-based and not two grams. Four gram magnesium doses probably uh, brings the magnesium up to a higher level, but it doesn't actually seem to create a clinical conundrum. So what, what these folks believe, and this is a small study, it's only about 55 patients, that the protocol was safe for ICU patients and also for patients who have renal impairment, giving them this higher dose of magnesium, giving them instead of two grams, giving them a four gram dose. And so you do four grams here, followed with four grams here, 
much easier for nurses, always give four grams. Give four grams at the first dose, give four grams at the second dose over those next periods of time. Now, if your patient has hypomagnesemia with serious cardiac dysrhythmias, you're going to give mag really fast. Now, in general, we, we don't love giving mag fast because we worry about diaphragmatic paralysis, but you're going to do that quickly here because the dysrhythm is so profound. So again, here, they're saying use a fixed dose at four instead of at two. That's going to increase the MAC level. And remember, it's going to bump it up, but it's going to come back down. And that's why you've got to continue on infusion. I feel like a lot of times we give MAC, but we're kind of slow to continuously infuse magnesium over time. We usually do it, but sometimes there's uh, some period of time where they've gotten their bolus, but we haven't hung the drip. Got to really actually maintain this continuity of magnesium. Uh, implementation. All right. So just being aware, a 50% mag sulfate solution, that's 500 milligrams per mil, has an osmo of 4,000. It's profoundly hyperosmolar and it can cause very significant profound dehydration. That's why we dilute it. Pharmacy does that for us in general. And we're so lucky that we have them. Just remember not to give it through with, with rigorous lactate or plasmolite should not be used uh, because that calcium will bind up and bind up the magnesium and reduce the effect of the infused magnesium. Every time you bolus somebody with magnesium, they're gonna rapidly excrete the uh, increased magnesium by the kidneys, as long as they have functional kidneys, which is why what you're gonna do is bolus and then continuously replete because that bolus dose raises the serum magnesium so significantly in the kidney will waste, 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 waste. You're going to do that nice, smooth, continuous infusion to actually restore cellular magnesium to a functional level. Okay, so always remember your serum MAC level will rise after that initial bolus, but it begins to fall after 15 minutes. And it's going to take one to two, perhaps up to four days for you to replenish the magnesium stores. So again, don't just feel good about yourself that you gave two or four grams magnesium sulfate First time you measured mag, it looked pretty good, but six hours later, it's going to drop down again unless you are doing a continuous replacement. And your docs may look at a magnesium retention test that's just giving patients a certain amount of magnesium in a 24-hour period and then measuring what's in the urine to actually look at whether or not the kidney is wasting more magnesium than it should. And that just helps you to evaluate whether this is a, a renal dysfunction. Okay, so here's the point. Yeah, we have kind of a limited understanding of how to best define magnesium status. The relationship of our magnesium levels and our patient outcomes is just not clear yet. The evidence doesn't say replacing magnesium is going to improve 60-day all-cause mortality. Does it improve or decrease length of stay on ventilators? Yes. Does it reduce length of stay in the ICU? Yes. But there are no studies yet that say it significantly profoundly affects all-cause mortality. Remember, a lot of the discussion in evidence is that magnesium didn't get repleted soon enough. It should be repleted at the first indication that you have hypokalemia or hypocalcemia or hypophosphatemia. Whether or not your serum magnesium is low, you should consider, I'm not saying you're going to do it, but you should have some discussion about whether or not to replace magnesium. And that leads to the other uncertainty. We're not sure that prophylactic magnesium, as well as therapeutic magnesium, is actually going to change outcomes. But it looks right now uh, to be that the discussion is about timing, not just administration, but timing. How soon do you do it in order to stabilize your patient? So I'm very grateful that you've joined here today. I'm thankful uh, to see you every time we come together. I hope I will see you again and again and again. I am going to log off here so that I'm no longer recording, but I will be available for questions and answers uh, if you stay on the line after I stop recording. Ta-ta for now. Thank you all very, very much.